Exploring Chiropractic, Episode 34, Primary Spine Care with Dr. Donald Murphy. Does chiropractic training prepare students to be primary care practitioners similar to the family medicine doctor? The answer is emphatically and absolutely not even close. Hey guys, I want to tell you about Backblaze.com. Backblaze is unlimited data backup for your Mac or PC for just $5 a month. It's unlimited files, unlimited file size, unlimited speed, and get this, it will back up all of your attached external drives. That's right, so not just the stuff on your computer, but you've got your your old photos, your old movies, uh, you can back up everything that's attached to your computer. Check it out, exploringchiropractic.com slash backblaze. Welcome back to Exploring Chiropractic, the only student chiropractic podcast. I'm Dr. Nathan Cashin. My guest this episode is clinical director of the Rhode Island Spine Center and the director of primary spine care services for the Care New England Health System. He also serves as clinical assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the Alpert Medical School of Brown University, the professor at Southern California University of Health Sciences, and adjunct associate professor in the Department of Research at New York Chiropractic College. You may have heard of the Clinical Reasoning in Spine Pain textbooks, which he has authored, and I'm very excited to bring him on the podcast to discuss his background in chiropractic, the concept of primary spine care, and more details about the CRISP protocols. Dr. Murphy also answers some listener questions. I hope you enjoy this interview with Dr. Donald Murphy. Dr. Murphy, thank you for joining me on Exploring Chiropractic. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me. So I was looking through your uh, your CV. One of your uh, previous interns or preceptors, I'm not sure what you call it, uh, Dr. Brendan McCann recommended I, I take a look at your CV. And I haven't been able to get through the whole thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's quite a volume. But I, the one thing that stood out to me is you you started in acting. Is that right? Yes, I was a um, theater major before I switched majors to uh, to, to pre chiropractic. So, what took you from acting to chiropractic? Well, um, my first two years of college, I was uh, again a theater major. I was uh, studying acting, and I was um, uh, that's what I wanted my career to be. Um, but as I was going along, I uh, decided that um, you know I loved acting, uh, but I uh, didn't have the level of passion that is required to um, to live the kind of life that an actor has to live while they're struggling to make it. And, um, you know, so I, I wanted something more steady and more stable. And so I actually took a year and a half off uh, after my first two years kind of to, quote, find myself, unquote, <laughs> uh, before deciding to go back to school and uh, and become a chiropractor. Did that time off involve any world travel, any type of uh, voyages that helped you find yourself or was yeah. it just taking a break? Well, not world travel, but country travel. I, I, I grew up in New York and uh, I was li- you know, I was living in New York. And uh, so I, I moved to California, uh, which, um, you know, in the 70s, early 80s, that's uh, that's what one did when one was finding oneself. I uh, moved to California. <laughs> so I, I lived in Newport Beach, California for uh, almost a year. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, just kind of um, working and living and, you know, uh, again, I, I, I didn't get, go out there to, to set out to find myself, but that's what ended up happening. <laughs> I got it. Um, so from there, how did you get into chiropractic? Did you have, you know, a miracle chiropractic story or was it just something you were aware of? Well, I came back uh, to New York after living in California and um, I had a friend who was just getting ready to start uh, New York Chiropractic College. And uh, so he would uh, talk to me about chiropractic and, um, you know, it sounded really interesting. I, I was always interested in, in health and fitness. Um, and so, uh, you know, that I was naturally intrigued to uh, to anything uh, related to health, but also, um, uh, you know, something natural and um, 
uh, you know, focused on uh, an active lifestyle and that kind of thing. And so I became intrigued. Uh, and then I developed a, a shoulder problem. And uh, so the, my friend encouraged me to see a chiropractor about it. And uh, the chiropractor was able to help me. So, um, so I said, okay, this is something that uh, I want to go into. Interesting. So, uh, the, the way you describe that, it, it almost sounds like um, kind of a spontaneous decision. How much time did you deliberate on going into chiropractic? Um, well, uh, this we're we're going back a couple of years, uh, so <laughs> I'm ta I'm taxing my memory a little bit. But um, I didn't. I don't think it took very long. I, I, I once I, um, you know, decided. Okay, I, I, I want to have a direction, um, uh, and I started to talking to this friend and had the chiropractic experience. It was pretty quick that um, that uh, you know I, I that this is the direction I wanted to go in. I find that interesting because recently um, I heard a very similar story. I don't know if you were familiar with Doctor Lester Lamb who's well known yeah. out here at Western States and he just passed away. Uh, and so at his, uh, you know, his memorial, they were playing a video and he, and he told a very similar story. He was in uh, the military, the Peace Corps. He came back, didn't know what to do with himself. And a friend was enrolling in chiropractic school and he kind of said, okay, I'll do that too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, which is, it seems very different to say my experience where I probably deliberated for about 10 years <laughs> um, before I actually started school. Yeah. Uh, so you went to New York Chiropractic College. Yes. And after that, I understand you did some postgraduate training. Yes, I um, first did the postgraduate training uh, in a certified chiropractic sports physician. Um, I got that certification, which was uh, I think a hundred hours or something like that. And then uh, I started the neurology diplomate program. And uh, that was a three-year process, and uh, uh, I er earned my diplomate in uh, chiropractic neurology, quote unquote. And um, during that time, I, I became very passionate about neurology uh, and neurodiagnosis, and so um, I supplemented my um, diplomate studies by um, uh, be making myself a pest to the. Uh, attending physicians at the local teaching hospital and in the neurology department uh, until they they let me come in and uh, do rotations with the with the neurology residents and um, and so I, I spent uh, over 200 hours um, uh, doing rotations with the residents uh, in the various um, clinics the neurology clinics and really getting a, a, a great education in, in neurodiagnosis at this time, you had already graduated. Were you in practice? Yes. Yep. I was pract practicing at the same time. So it was a very time-consuming process. Yeah. And that, I find that interesting that you were able to, <laughs> after some uh, pestering, as you say, convince them. I think a lot of students really would love to have an opportunity like that. Um, but I, I certainly have tried a couple of times and just gotten so much pushback or or disinterest that it was hard to keep to keep trying what what led to that persistence um well I, I think that what was very helpful to me was uh that i showed myself to not only be persistent to these uh folks in the neurology department but also passionate about learning and sincere about learning um and so you know these this was a teaching hospital, so the people who are involved, the, the 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 attending physicians there, are teachers. And you know, as a teacher myself, and as and you you can imagine because you said you were you had had te taught yourself as well. Um, teachers love to teach, and so there's nothing that a teacher loves more than so to, than to encounter somebody who's passionate about learning what they have to teach. And so I I. Um, inadvertently appealed to that aspect of their nature. And I think that was my biggest asset. What did you do other than doing the, the diplomat program in neurology? And was that, by the way, was that through Carrick at the time or was this a different program? Nope. That was, uh, th it was run by a guy named uh, Dr. Joseph Ferrazzi, who I think still has a, a, a course running. Um, and it was through the New York Chiropractic College. 
Oh, interesting. I hadn't heard of that one. Um, okay. So outside of the diplomat program, what types of things did you do to educate yourself to um, to prove your your devotion and passion for learning to allow you to get into these teaching hospitals? Well, I um, in addition to and separate from that process of taking the the, the uh, neurology course and and um, doing the, the neurology rotations, I, I, I was uh, passionate about learning, and I also recognized that. In chiropractic school, um, whereas you know my education in New York Chiropractic College was was good, uh, it did not provide me with what I really needed to know to help my patients to um, to be an excellent diagnostician, an excellent uh, treater um, of uh, patients with the various kinds of problems they came in with. And so, uh, you know, I, I realized that um, if I'm going to uh, gain that knowledge, I'm going to have to, to do it on my own. And so I did, uh, spent a lot of time reading the literature and, um, studying books. And, um, I traveled abroad to the Czech Republic on two separate occasions, studying under, um, Dr. Vladimir Yanda and Dr. Carol Levitt. Uh, and I studied with them, uh, here as well in the States when they came here. And uh, studied um, under um, Dr. Janet Travell and uh, a, a wide number of people, just trying to gather and gain as much knowledge and experience and skill as I possibly could. Um, that would help me be the the best, um, as it turns out, spine doctor as as I could be. At that time, I didn't see myself as a spine doctor per se. I f saw myself as um, a musculoskeletal. Uh, uh, doctor, but I realized uh, as time goes on, went went on, and I'm sure we'll get to this that uh, primary spine care was my real passion. Let's let's get into that because that is one of the big topics um, that I'm interested in at the time at, at this present time. Um, explain for my listeners what is primary spine care. Primary spine care <clears throat> is. Um, a new new role that we're introducing into the healthcare system, uh, wherein a practitioner, a primary spine practitioner, plays the role of primary care for patients with spine problems. So uh, this person um, uh, uh, needs to be capable of managing the majority of spine pr uh, patients without the need for referral, but also uh, knowing how to um, manage the case, manage the situation, uh, be the quarterback of the uh, spine care team, uh, which means uh, understanding, uh, uh, keenly understanding differential diagnosis, uh, knowing when to recognize when somebody needs um, special tests uh, uh, or specialist consults, knowing and identifying when somebody needs uh, to, uh, uh, invasive procedures such as injections or surgery or intensive procedures such as multidisciplinary pain management. Um, recognizing when somebody uh, requires uh, um, a, a, a psych psychological or behavioral um, intervention and following up with that patient to make sure that they maintain uh, on track, they keep themselves on track toward resolution. So literally being the primary care practitioner for uh, patients with spine-related disorders. So we mentioned uh, before we started recording how there's a, a f kind of a spectrum between the schools, how a lot of schools have different approaches, and uh, some of them really brand themselves as training primary care practitioners. Um, but I have to say, I have some reservations myself about whether the the amount of experience we get really qualifies us. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Does the chiropractic curriculum as it stands provide a deep enough training to allow students that are graduating to, to be that primary spine practitioner? To be the primary spine practitioner or the general or even the, primary care practitioner? Maybe both. I, I guess I, I consider them somewhat the same um, in that you do need to have that broad knowledge of, of differentials and, and when to refer out. Um, Maybe okay. take one at a time. Okay. So um, do, does chiropractic training prepare students to be uh, 
primary care practitioners similar to the family medicine doctor or the general internal medicine doctor? And the answer is emphatically and absolutely not even close. Uh, my, I'm, I have a faculty, my primary faculty appointment is at the, the medical school at Brown University. Uh, most of my teaching is in the fam. Uh, my appointment is in the family medicine uh, department. Most of my teaching is either family medicine residents or internal medicine residents. I get to interact with uh, real primary care doctors uh, and real primary care trainees, uh, training in real primary care. And chiropractic education is so far from what is required to be a true primary care doctor that it's um, it, it's not even. Uh, worth having a conversation about, except the fact that there are many chiropractors who think they are trained to be primary care practitioners <laughs> and many schools who think they are training primary care practitioners. And that was my experience. Uh, certainly my school emphasizes that. Um, but I, I remember having a discussion at one time with one of the faculty that, you know, when I was an undergrad, I had a roommate who was a nursing student. In under This was pre-nursing and he had to do I think it was at the time, 100 sets of vitals, uh, heart rate, blood pressure, maybe even listening to heart sounds, although I don't think nursing students do that very often. But in my experience going through chiropractic school, I think our numbers were 10, 20 uh, sets of vitals. And I just didn't feel like I was getting the experience with it that I needed to, to be able to confidently tell other doctors and patients that I can be your primary contact. Right. Right. And, and if you, and if you speak to people in the general healthcare community, even those that are open to chiropractors, uh, if you even mention chiropractors as general primary care practitioners, you'll either get a blank stare or a hearty laugh. <laughs> Or very concerned looks. Or very concerned looks. That's that very good point. Or very concerned looks, uh, because that is so. Uh, the the notion is so far fetched. So, what about chiropractic students uh, coming out of their three or four years of training, being prepared to be the primary spine practitioner? Okay, so now we're talking. So, uh, chiropractic training prepares students to be prepared to become primary spine practitioners. <laughs> okay. Okay. So they, uh, the chiropractic students gain a lot of the basic knowledge, a lot of the basic skills that are necessary to be a primary spine practitioner, but are not sufficient to be a primary spine practitioner. So additional training, additional knowledge, additional experience is necessary to really become a bona fide uh, primary spine practitioner. But of all the um, healthcare schools out there, chiropractic schools are the closest to, uh, tr to providing their students with the knowledge and skills that are needed to become primary spine practitioners. But I have the opportunity to, um, to uh, ha I have a regular externship at my uh, facility. And uh, so I, I've been uh, training interns from several different chiropractic schools for the past 20 years or so. Uh, so I have a pretty good experience, and these are the the uh, the most highly motivated chiropractic students because they're willing to travel and find lodging to to, to spend uh, uh, ten ten to fifteen weeks with me. Uh, the the most highly motivated students, and they're not uh, they're not uh, I shouldn't say they're not close. They are fairly close, but they do not have the knowledge and skills to serve as as a primary spine practitioner. They're closer than anybody else. Uh, in terms of healthcare schools, but they don't have all that it takes. What will that training look like? Is this another diplomat program of 300 hours? How will a student or a current practitioner become prepared to be a primary spine care practitioner? Yeah. As it stands now, uh, I'm in the process of we're just finishing up and getting ready to launch a uh, course uh, through the University of Pittsburgh. Um, that is a one-year course that provides uh, additional training uh, for to, to to be able to serve as this uh, in this role of primary spine practitioner. Um, <clears throat> it consists of five modules. Uh, I'm sorry, five units we call them. Five units. Uh, each unit uh, consists of a weekend 
seminar and a series of online uh, courses uh, takes place over a year. And uh, there's a, a unit exam at the end of each unit. And then there's a final practical exam at the end of the, uh, the course. And uh, <clears throat> this, this will be the, the beginning of the official certification process for primary spine practitioners. So we're doing it the, uh, through the University of Pittsburgh, um, but also it's uh, um, in uh, a loose partnership with Southern California University of Health Sciences, which is where Los Angeles Car College of Chiropractic is. Um, and so this is the beginning of the uh, formal certification training of primary spine practitioners. Ultimately, primary spine care training has to be what well, will have to be a residency based uh, training, but we're, you know, that's down the road. That's, that's what we're looking toward, but you have to start somewhere. So this is where we're starting. Will this training be available to current students or is this only a postgraduate opportunity? Um, it's uh, designed for postgraduates. So uh, to be eligible for the certification, uh, one has to have graduated from a <clears throat> healthcare institution and, and be able to have the basic knowledge and skills required to then be augmented to be uh, to become a primary spine practitioner. <clears throat> Will students be able to start the coursework before they're graduated? Um, currently, the uh, and, and I, uh, um, I'll preface this by saying that I'm responsible for uh, the content and the delivery of the uh, the information. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, an official at the University of, P of Pittsburgh, so policy will be established by the university. But currently, the plan is for for um, this to be a postgraduate course, just as a medical graduate who wants to, uh, you know, become an internal medicine physician or a neurologist uh, will need to graduate medical school and then go on to additional training. Uh, it's the same thing. You need to graduate from uh, chiropractic school in order to then go on and, and continue your training to be a PSP. The University of Bridgeport recently <clears throat> held a panel that was shared on Facebook uh, about the primary spine practitioner initiative or, or goal of many to, to kind of start this specialty. And needless to say, there's a lot of um, controversy, I guess you could say that might be a strong word, but a lot of people have concerns and one of the main questions is, will labeling chiropractors as primary spine practitioners limit their scope? Uh, th that's the most common uh, uh, concern that I hear from chiropractors, <clears throat> that it will be limiting. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's kind of funny because the, for, the one th for one thing, uh, chiropractors currently see about 10% of the population. Uh, Pretty much 100% of the population have spine problems at some point, if you consider back pain, neck pain, and headaches. Um, so, uh, you know, I asked the question, which is limiting, 10% or 90%? <laughs> so uh, it, it's really um, kind of um, uh, amusing to, uh, to consider this limiting. Um, the other thing that I would have to say is that uh, I've been practicing as a primary spine practitioner for pretty much the, most of the last 20 years. I've been in practice 29 years. Uh, and, and I'm now uh, uh, in charge of a program, um, an integrated spine care program at a, a, a large hospital system and uh, where primary spine care services are the, uh, are the main focus of the program. And um, I love seeing patients with spine problems. P spine care is my passion. Uh, I try to avoid uh, uh, extremity problems. Even actively trying to avoid seeing patients with exter extremity problems, I have plenty of them come in. I have patients come in re referred by uh, ear, nose, and throat doctors who have orofacial pain. Uh, I have patients come, uh, referred in who have shoulder pain, uh, knee pain. Um, and I try to, I, well, I, lo I love seeing the orofacial pain patients, but the extremity pa patients, I, I, I don't have much of an interest in that. And even trying to avoid those things, I can't avoid them. I, I get plenty of them. If I wanted to pursue seeing more extremity problems, I would be inundated with them. So uh, the, in, in reality, if, if a chiropractor uh, establishes credibility in their core area uh, of primary spine care, they will then be able to leverage that credibility 
into other areas. So it's not, not only is it not limiting, it's expansive. And that's what has been my experience. Very interesting. Uh, so you've mentioned how uh, eventually the goal is to have this almost as a residency. Um, and I have a listener question. This is from Isaac, who asked, what is the best path to getting more DCs hired in the mainstream healthcare delivery system? That's a great question from Isaac. And um, <clears throat> uh, it's it's not an easy one to answer. However, um, it, it, basically, for a chiropractor to uh, become involved in uh, mainstream healthcare, it'll be as a spine care doctor or it won't happen at all, with the, with the exception of sports medicine. So sports medicine, chiropractors, several chiropractors have had success in uh, um, uh, in, in incorporating themselves in the mainstream of of uh, of sports of the sports medicine world, um, so that that's a that's a niche that's uh, that's available to chiropractors that uh, many uh, have taken advantage of. Um, but aside from that, um, if one wants to be a, a part of the mainstream health system, it's going to be as a spine spine doctor, or it's not going to be as anything. So um, a, and uh, what the healthcare system is looking for is uh, people to be able to play innovative new roles that provide value uh, in certain areas of, of medicine that currently uh, uh, high value is not currently being provided. Um, and so the, the healthcare system has never been more open to, uh, uh, I, I hate to use the word alternative, but um, alternative, if I if I may use that term, um, uh, mechanisms of delivering quality healthcare, and so uh, it, the the probably the most expensive, least effective, and messy areas of all of medicine is spine, and so uh, the opportunity exists. But what we we have to to uh, to realize is that. Um, as it stands now, uh, saying I provide chiropractic care, uh, it means that means something to us. It means something to our patients. But in the wider healthcare world, they don't quite understand what that means. Which is why I think primary spine care uh, has a um, you know has a, a, a resonance. It resonates with people in the healthcare system um, uh, because that's a, an area that is is uh, where there's a recognized need. You told me that you did your sports certification, and I was just certified, and I did the master's in sports medicine here at Western States, and that certainly was my original interest in chiropractic. I was, you know, was active as a teenager, and that's part of my first introduction to chiropractic, um, and I appreciate that you shared that sports chiropractic is one of the other ways that chiropractic can become more widely accepted. Um, do you see, and this, this is kind of taking a, another listener question, um, who asks, what is the best way to start integrating this, uh, spine practitioner into a more traditional rehab or adjusting based office? And I just want to add to that. How can, uh, a primary spine practitioner continue, say their passion for sports or any other interests that they may have in chiropractic? Um, well, you know the 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 uh, primary spine care and 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 interest in sports medicine are not mutually exclusive. Uh, I mean, for one thing, there's a there are plenty of um, sports injuries that involve the spine, um, and certainly having credibility as a spine practitioner will uh, be helpful in terms of um, uh, being rec a, a recognized expert in those those kinds of, of problems. But uh, but again, uh, having you know being a sports uh, a sports oriented primary spine practitioner, I, I don't see that being mutually exclusive at all. Excellent, that uh, makes me very hopeful. Now you also have written two textbooks uh, on spine pain, on uh, this idea of the spine practitioner. What led to writing these books? Well, as I uh, went along my journey of um, uh, recognizing uh, the limitations of what I knew and what I was uh, what I was able to do, 
uh, in helping people overcome spine related problems. Um, <clears throat> I started reading the, the literature. I started taking seminars. I started uh, studying uh, abroad, et cetera. And I realized that there was a lot of good evidence based information out there. Uh, but it was very disparate. It was all over it. And there, and there was no connection uh, between all of the different um, uh, models of care, all of the different uh, the, uh, information and, and, uh, and research that was, was available in, in the field. And so I, I said, we well, need to have a way to, um, to bring this all together into, into a cohesive model that can be applied in a busy practice environment. And so as that evolved, I ended up writing a textbook in the, in the late 90s uh, called Conservative Management of Cervical Spine Syndromes. And uh, <clears throat> that, that began the process of my culminating all of this information into a cohesive approach. Uh, as I developed that approach, I said, well, you know, does this, does this approach uh, really work in, 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 in the real world? And so I started doing observational studies, looking at groups of patients and uh, who are treated according to this approach, which I had a, a, a name for it that I won't e I won't bother you with because it was kind of cumbersome a cumbersome name, <clears throat> but uh, observationally at least, uh, what I found was that yeah, patients uh, seem to uh, benefit from these uh, from this approach, and so uh, I uh, as I started uh, formalizing this process and started. Uh, uh, I wasn't alone in this, uh, uh, um, conceptualizing this primary spine practitioner role, I and a team of others um, who are co-authors on my original paper, <clears throat> started um, uh, uh, culminating this um, uh, new role, this primary spine practitioner. At this, this melded well with the clinical approach that I was putting together that considered all of the biological psychological and social factors that can contribute to the spine uh, pain experience into a diagnostic and treatment model that could be again applied in a uh, in a in a busy practice environment uh, so i developed this clinical reasoning process by which the uh, spine practitioner can <clears throat> again consider the multiple factors that can contribute to the spine pain experience uh, figure out what which of those factors are contributing in this particular patient's case, and how can I formulate a diagnosis from that, and then formulate a management strategy that um, is most likely to respond positively to those uh, to the the diagnostic factors that I identified. And so I call them the CRISP protocols: clinical reasoning and spine pain. And so I ended up writing these two books. Uh, one is primarily focused on the low back, and the other is primarily focused on the cervical spine, with a chapter on um, on uh, the thoracic spine. <clears throat> and these uh, these became uh, basically the operations manual for the primary spine practitioner. As a matter of fact, the second volume of the textbook has two um, uh, chapters on case studies in primary spine care, where I go through um, eighteen cases. And uh, I go through the process of, from the first presentation of the patient, how the primary spine practitioner would look at that patient, evaluate them, interact with them, um, uh, uh, establish a diagnosis, decide on a management strategy, and then guide that patient from having this pain, disability, and suffering experience to resolution of the problem and all of the different things that has to happen on that process. Uh, again, uh, spine pain is multifactorial. There are biological factors, somatic. Uh, there are neurophysiological factors. There are psychological factors, all occurring in the social context in which the patient lives. And so the primary spine practitioner has to be able to look at all of those things, figure out, all right, which of those factors are playing a role in this particular person's um, uh, suffering, and how can I address those and help them overcome this problem? whether it's things that I can do myself, whether it's things that I need to obtain from uh, other uh, members of the spine care team. Um, but I am, in, I am the uh, one who's responsible for guiding the patient along that process toward resolution. And so the, uh, the, the, the books put that process together, clinical reasoning and spine pain or the, the CRISP protocols, put that process together and help the uh, spine practitioner um, uh, utilize this clinical reasoning process in, in practice. 
the first volume I've already read through, and it certainly helped me clarify uh, the just the framework in my mind about how I was approaching a patient. And, you know, I, I came out of school, I think, knowing all of these different pieces. Um, I certainly knew a lot about diagnosis, a lot about treatment, soft tissue adjustment, but I didn't feel like I knew how to fit them all together in a co cohesive way. And I think that's really what these textbooks have helped me with. And I think a lot of students have had that same experience. So I really appreciate it. Yep. And that, that is exactly what it was designed for, um, is to, to, you know, I have these skills, I have the, 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 this knowledge. How do I apply? What do I do in what situation when? Uh, and uh, how do I make sense of, um, you know, uh, this whole situation? And how do I respond utilizing the skills I have? You mentioned your co-authors and some other. Uh, uh, I, I noticed you you had a long list of acknowledgments in both textbooks, and I'm curious who you, you've already mentioned uh, Yonda and Levitt. Who are some other influences that have really informed your practice and guided you along the way? Um, <clears throat> well, one of the the biggest ones in terms of uh, the overall, my overall uh, view of healthcare and primary spine care, and where the PSP can fit into the the broader healthcare world, is Scott Haldeman, Doctor Scott Haldeman. You may be familiar with him. Um, Certainly, yes. He he, uh, he helped me to um, kind of crystallize the evidence based approach to spine care, but also uh, where that fits in the broader. Uh, scheme of uh, of the healthcare system, and so uh, he he was extremely influ influential and still is um, on my thought process with re with that regard. Um, and 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 again, my my um, my learning journey uh, over the past um, thirty years has been so eclectic that there are so many different people that. Um, that influenced that process. But certainly, I mentioned um, uh, Dr. Joe Ferrazzi, who taught the neurology course. Uh, I learned a tremendous about a, 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 a tremendous um, amount about uh, neurodiagnosis from him, and he helped me to kind of uh, see where neurodiagnosis plays uh, as an important role in, 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 um, in spine care. Um, uh, I, I, I mentioned in the book, Yond and, and Levitt, I mentioned earlier, I have a team of people that I uh, work with uh, implementing um, the integrated spine uh, care pathway that I'm currently imp implementing in, in the hospital system where I work um, that have been very, very helpful to me in uh, um, broadening my view of where primary spine care fits in to the wider spine care world of people like uh, Dr. Brian Justice, Dr. John Ventura, Dr. Ian Piskowski. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Tom Nooner, uh, they're my partners in this this process of um, uh, bringing this integrated spine care pathway to other hospital systems, payers, and and uh, other uh, healthcare delivery systems, uh, where primary spine care services and integrated uh, primary spine care pathways can be implemented and uh, really um, uh, respond to the value model that is so important um, in, in the coming healthcare system. Uh, Michael Schneider, Dr. Michael Schneider is my, my partner at the, in the course at uh, the PSP course at um, the University of Pittsburgh. He's been a very important person in this process. Um, uh, Mark Laslett is a physical therapist uh, from New Zealand who has done so much work in uh, diagnosis, I, identifying pain generators in the spine, and, and using an evidence-based approach to uh, to uh, in a credible way identify pain gen pain generators. And Robin McKenzie, who developed the McKenzie approach, uh, also has been uh, very influential in, in in that regard in terms of, of diagnosis and uh, helping to bring um, uh, to teach people how to take care of themselves. Uh, boy, there's such a large number of, peop of people that have, have been an influence, and uh, I hate to leave anybody out. Um, well, I definitely will refer everyone to the acknowledgments in both textbooks. Yeah. 
Um, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd kind of like to come back to Dr. Scott Haldeman because I am uh, a big fan. He's got World Spine Care, which I'm a volunteer with. Um, but as I as I look at, I guess, my influences or, or the people who I look to and respect and Dr. Haldeman uh, certainly is there. Uh, you have made the list recently with with the textbooks. Um, I'm noticing some similarities, and I read through Scott Haldeman's biography, and two things I would, I guess, I would like to ask you about. Number one, you seem to be involved in a, a wide range of things, and I'm curious, how do you personally manage uh, to do so many different things? and to do so productively oh wow well i i uh i think i'm i'm very good with uh organization and time management um uh so i you know that's that's really the key to to uh getting a lot done in in a normal 24-hour day Uh, i'd love to have my days be 36 or 48 hours long but unfortunately they're they're 24 hours like the rest of us um but uh, but being organized and uh, being a good time manager is uh, is extremely important. Um, and you know I'm driven by passion, and that's the that's the biggest thing. If if you have passion, you figure out a way. The other similarity that I see, and again going back to your CV with a long list of articles, is that again both you and Dr. Haldeman have published a lot. Uh, is writing something that you've always enjoyed doing or have done throughout your life? Uh, yes. Ever since I was a kid, I was a writer. Uh, I used to write stories. I used to write, um, uh, b- believe it or not, this sounds awfully geeky, but I used to write um, book reports. Um, you know, if we were assigned a, a, a book report in elementary school, I would write three instead of the one that was assigned. Um, uh, uh, I just always loved to write and that was just, uh, something that's, that's in me. And so that certainly has helped. I talked to a lot of people that have trouble writing, sitting down and writing what, you know, what's on their mind. And, um, I just happen to be a, the type of person that, uh, writing comes very natural to me. I definitely am the opposite. The book reports were the hardest thing for me to get through in elementary school. And I remember one day in particular, we had a a journaling assignment where we just had to write, what did you do over the weekend? And I ended up staying at least an hour after school because I just couldn't get it out. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Do you feel like writing has led uh, to your successes? Does it play a role in understanding uh, spine care and spine pain? Absolutely. One of the things that I find is that through writing, that is the way in which I, I bring my ideas to fruition. I bring what's kind of floating around in the back of my head to the front uh, and allows me to really um, um, uh, communicate to myself as well as to others what's, what's on my mind and what, uh, what I've learned and uh, uh, how I can put it all together. So I find writing to be very, very helpful in that regard. And uh, my writing has been helpful in my career because, um, uh, you know, when when your name is out there and your work is out there and and, uh, and if fortunately people um, find your work to be of high quality and beneficial, um, that brings you recognition that that um, is uh, it it can be brought by, you know, through personal communication. uh, But having publications out there are really helpful in that regard. Well, I do have a patient uh, scheduled in just a little bit, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't get through some of uh, the other listener questions that were submitted. Um, Jerome asks on Facebook, does the Audible release play a role in outcomes? I'm assuming he's, a, he's talking about the uh, cavitation with spinal manipulation. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. So um, manipulation is a very useful tool. It's uh, not the only tool, and uh, I encourage chiropractors to avoid uh, attaching their identity to uh, to that one procedure, and it, rather they attach their identity to helping patients overcome problems, um, being a problem solver. Um, so I'll I'll start with that. Um, the The literature is uh, pretty clear, and this uh, there's been a number of studies that 
Uh, the audible release itself is not a necessary component in order to bring about uh, benefit of manipulation. Um, my experience is that it's it's highly individual. That if you take if you look at a population of patients and you treat one population with a, a, a high velocity technique that brings about an audible release, and another population with a low velocity technique that does not bring about an audible release, pretty much both groups will do just as well. They will we will will both benefit equally. But there are individuals within each group that may benefit from a cavitation technique, whereas there, there are other individuals that may benefit more from a non-cavitation technique. So I think it's essential for chiropractors to be good at both, be good at cavitation techniques, be good at low velocity non-cavitation techniques. Um, Dr. Dean Smith asks, and I think this is very helpful for recent graduates, with what you know now, how might you approach chiropractic school and practice differently as a new graduate compared to the way you originally did? Oh, wow. Um, that's a great question. How would I approach? Well, I, I would definitely be more focused. Uh, I would definitely um, be more, I, I would have my, uh, my again, my self-identity, as I just mentioned, um, my self-identity placed firmly in the area of I'm uh, my purpose is to help patients overcome spine-related disorders uh, rather than uh, place my identity on a, cer a certain set of procedures. Um, uh, that frees you. That's, that's a very freeing uh, process because uh, if, if you're just here to help, um, if, uh, if you see your identity and your role as just helping people, then whatever you do to, to help people is what you do. And uh, if somebody disparages manipulation, that doesn't reflect on you personally. You don't, you don't have to take that personally because manipulation is simply a tool that you use to fulfill your real mission, and that, and that is helping people. So I think I would, that, that would be my, the main thing I would do differently is really focus my, my identity and my approach on, on helping patients rather than on who I am and what I do. Lastly, I'd like to ask for those who may be considering chiropractic school, what do you feel is the most important thing students can do when choosing to go into chiropractic and then choosing a chiropractic school? Uh, well, I think number one, um, uh, being realistic and recognizing that um, the chiropractic profession is in, the pro is in a maturation process as a profession. Uh, we're in the process of, of uh, we're in our adolescence and we're, we're trying to find ourselves. If you remember the, the, the painful period of adolescence, you remember you were trying to find yourself and you were uh, conflicted and uh, it was a very turbulent uh, period. And, and it was awful. Was that? <laughs> it was an awful time. Yeah, well, awful, but, but an, a, a time of opportunity because you came out of that with a crystal clear identity of who you are. And so chiropractic is currently in its adolescence. And we're, uh, I think we're going to come out of the, our adolescence having a clear vision of who and what we are, what we have to offer. Um, but right now we're, we're in our adolescence. And I think we need to be realistic about that and, uh, and really work toward, um, you know, come, uh, maturing and becoming an adult profession. And that's not, I don't mean that disparaging, by the way, that we're uh, immature babies as a profession. That's just the natural evolution of professions. Well, Dr. Murphy, thank you so much. Where can students learn more about you and about the primary spine practitioner process? Um, the, the, there will be a, a web presence um, if, with the University of Pittsburgh uh, um, uh, course. To learn more about me and about primary spine care in general, I would encourage them to visit uh, the, the website of, of, of uh, Spine Care Partners, which is a, a company that I'm a part of. Um, if you just Google uh, Spine Care Partners, and uh, the Primary Spine Practitioner Network. Um, there'll be inf information about me and about primary spine care there. And uh, I, I'm re I'd be remiss but if, if I didn't say um, my books have a lot of good information about both as well. I highly recommend the books. I'll include links in the show notes for students to find those directly on Amazon, uh, as well as links to a lot of the other things that uh, we have discussed today as well as a collection of papers that discuss uh, primary spine care 
uh, from a number of different viewpoints. Well, thank you so much. I have so many other questions I would love to get to, so maybe we can uh, find a time in the future to continue this conversation. That'd be great. Thanks. Don't forget to get your unlimited data backup for your Mac or PC for just $5 a month by going to exploringchiropractic.com slash backblaze. Hey, I greatly appreciate an iTunes review. Please go to Exploring Chiropractic on iTunes and leave a review with your comments and thoughts about the show. You can also contact me at exploringchiropractic.com on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Exploring Cairo. 